Section 9 of The Outline of Science, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Irma Martin. The Outline of Science by J. Arthur Thompson. Chapter 19, Biology, Part 1. Biology. The Nature of Life. Reproduction. Regeneration. The Ductless Glands. By Julian S. Huxley, M.A. Matter, Living and Lifeless From the earliest times human beings have pondered over the nature of life. At the beginning they tended to think of all things in terms of themselves, to read a life into the wind, a spirit into the river, a soul like their own into the birds and beasts. Nor did man even hesitate, as Voltaire so succinctly put it, to construct God in his own image. But this projection of oneself into the objects of the world around, or anthropomorphism, as it is generally called, is, from any scientific or rational point of view, one of the cardinal vices of the mind. To discover the real nature of things, we must discard all prejudices, all purely instinctive ways of thinking, and labor along the stony but sure path of reason and verification. At the outset, it seemed self-evident to anthropomorphism that all living things were alive because endued with some vital principle, some spirit of life, which departed from them at death. But all recent work is making it ever more probable that there is no such specific vital force, and that life is but one name for the manifestations of particular types of matter, a very complicated construction. By putting a man or an animal in a special chamber, fitted up as a calorimeter, we can measure the amount of energy produced by him in the form of work and of heat. And we find that, within the ordinary limits of experiment, it is identical with the amount of energy which would have been produced in the form of heat if the food supplied to him had been burnt. The principle of the conservation of energy thus holds good for a dog or a man, as well as for a steam engine or a dynamo. No special vital energy is being mysteriously introduced. It is the same with the chemical composition of living organisms. There are no elements in our bodies which do not exist in lifeless matter. And indeed the chemical constituents of living matter are all to be reckoned among the commoner elements. The bulk of living substance is composed of four ubiquitous elements. Carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, and oxygen. Besides these, iron, phosphorus, sulfur, sodium, potassium, calcium, chlorine, and probably iodine seem to be universally present. It was at one time supposed that a distinction between living and non-living matter could be drawn in respect of their powers of chemical construction. Many chemical substances, such as starch, sugar, albumin, urea, and so forth, are only to be found normally as the product of living organisms, and it was supposed that the vital force concerned itself with the manufacture of such special compounds. This again, however, has proved not to be founded in fact. In the middle of last century, Wohler succeeded in synthesizing urea out of lifeless matter in a test tube. Since that day, more and more organic substances have been artificially made. The most complicated chemical substances which have been isolated from living matter are the proteins, such as the albumin of egg white, consisting as they do of hundreds, often thousands, of atoms. These are combined, first of all, into comparatively simple compounds called amino acids, and the amino acids in their turn are linked together in definite ways to form the hundreds and thousands of different proteins that we know. Emil Fischer has succeeded in artificially linking together a number of amino acids to form a very complicated synthetic compound, and there can be little doubt that it is only a question of time until synthetic proteins can be made out of lifeless material in the laboratory. There is thus no measurable scientific criterion by which we can distinguish living from lifeless matter. The kinds of matter are the same. The ways they work, their energy transformations, are the same. It is only their arrangement that is different. Living matter is a particular and very elaborate arrangement of ordinary matter. If this at first sight seems startling, we may remind ourselves that it is only the arrangement of the same twenty-six letters that distinguishes 
say, Hamlet's Soliloquy, or Keats' Ode to a Nightingale, from a page of advertisements or a limerick. Of the origin of life we have, in the nature of things, as yet no definite knowledge. But everything points towards this conclusion, that during the gradual cooling down of this planet, a state of affairs arose, which inevitably led to the production, in that cosmic laboratory, of molecules which were alive, in that they had the power of reproducing themselves and reacting to stimuli, and gave rise to the living things that we see today. In other words, that there has not only been an evolution of all living things from one common ancestor, but of all life from not life. Section 1. Can mind arise from lifeless matter? But, it will be immediately objected, what about mind? Man and the higher animals possess mind. Can we suppose that that too has arisen from lifeless matter? It may very well be that we can, if we somewhat enlarge our ordinary view of the nature of matter. It is now a commonplace of psychology that self-consciousness is not the only, but simply the highest development of mind. Below it are the various grades of mental being, leading through the types of consciousness that young children seem to possess down to and beyond the subconscious types of mind that hypnotism and psychoanalysis reveal. We have only to be completely logical and believe that something of the same general nature as mind exists in all life, to make the further step and believe that it exists even in the matter from which life sprang. In that case, as G. H. Parker has well said, we would have to enlarge our definition of matter, for the properties of matter, that is to say, of the world stuff, would include mind. Perhaps an analogy will make the argument clearer. We know that every time a muscle contracts a slight electrical discharge is produced. The same is true of a gland each time it secretes, and probably no process of life is possible without some minute accompanying electrical charge. But these electrical charges are only just measurable, and in the vast majority of organisms are of no use whatever to their possessors. In the electric eel, however, and one or two other fish, certain muscles of the body have been modified to form electrical organs, in which the small electrical charges are added to each other, so that their cumulative effect is a serious shock. Electrical change, that is to say, occurs in all organisms inevitably, because of the way they are made, but in these few animals special organs have been evolved for intensifying electrical change, and so making it of use to its possessor. In the same way, if we think of the processes of matter as always involving some rudimentary, infinitesimal change of the general kind we call mental, it appears that, in the course of evolution, organs, which we call brains, have been evolved for intensifying these changes, and so giving rise to mental activity of direct use to its possessors. Theories of the Origin of Life There have been other theories of the origin of life on this planet. For instance, that its germs were transported here on meteorites from other stars, but this only removes the problem of life's origin one step back and does not solve it. At the present day, when the conditions must be very different from those which could have existed when life was first evolved, there does not seem to be any spontaneous transformation of lifeless into living matter. This has only been proved in quite recent years. The doctrine of spontaneous generation has been held by all primitive peoples, and maintained itself even among scientific men, until the middle of last century. The popular belief that a dead carcass would breed bees is to be found in the Bible and in Virgil. Country folk believe to this day that a horse hair put into a pond will become transformed into an eel, and it was only in the 18th century that Reddy disproved the popular supposition that maggots were bred from decaying meat by showing that none appeared when the meat was screened and when the flies could not therefore lay their eggs on it. The discovery of the microscope, however, and its revelation of the teeming, hitherto invisible world of protozoa, unicellular plants, moles, and bacteria, altered the position, and it was believed almost universally that those low forms of life were generally spontaneously in the processes of decay. It was Pasteur 
the great Finch scientist, who together with Tyndall and others finally gave the theory of spontaneous generation its death blow. By a series of ingenious experiments, he showed that liquids, which in ordinary circumstances would become a mass of bacteria in a day or so, remained free from all living organisms if thoroughly boiled. This was true even if fresh air was admitted to them, provided that it was filtered through cotton wool, or in some way first made to deposit any solid particles it contained. In fact, he showed conclusively that whenever life appeared spontaneously in a culture fluid, it had always really been transported there through the air in the form of invisible germs, and thus, without realizing it, he laid the foundation of the whole science and practice of a bacteriology. Nowhere is there to be found a better example of vastly important practical results accruing from the simple pursuit of knowledge for knowledge's own sake. It is safe to say that every organism living today has descended from a pre-existing organism. The chain of life has been unbroken since before the first records of geological history millions and millions of years ago. Section 2 Protoplasm and the Construction of the Body Protoplasm, as a great 19th century biologist said, is the physical basis of life. It is the living part of all organisms, whether animals or plants, as distinguished from such non-living substances as hair, or the hard parts of bone, or accumulations of fat or starch, all of which are products of its activity. Under the microscope, it is seen to be a semi-liquid substance, somewhat granular, almost colorless, apparently simple, but really, as we know, of the utmost chemical complexity. Some of the lowest forms of life, like the amoeba, are naked and undifferentiated bits of this living matter, but even in their unspecialized protoplasm we find the rudiments of all the properties to be found in the highest animals and the most delicate organs. In the first place, it has the power of assimilation. It can build up dead matter into its living molecules and transform foreign material into substance like its own. Then it is sensitive to stimuli. Mechanical shock will cause it to contract. Strong light or heat will damage it. Certain chemicals will attract or repel it. Electric currents will force it to move in a particular direction. It is out of these primitive properties that all our complex sense organs have been built up. Because light will alter the protoplasm of an amoeba, it has been possible for life to evolve an eye. And, be it remembered, the reverse is true. Hertzian or wireless waves are so large that they do not affect simple protoplasm, and no sense organ has been evolved for their perception. The amoeba uses up oxygen and gives out carbonic acid gas. It can move, it grows, it reproduces. Such are the fundamental properties of all protoplasm, and on these evolution has reared its great edifice and brought into being that almost incredible multiplicity of species. Nearly a million are known already, of animals and plants, ranging from a whale to a flea, an oak to a toadstool, a tapeworm to a bird, a bacterium to a lily, a jellyfish to an ant community, a worm to a philosopher. Section 3. The Units of Life we have already seen that apparently homogeneous bits of matter, a half crown, or a tumbler full of water, or a grain of salt, are all composed of minute material units or molecules. In a similar way, the bodies of living things are built up out of units. If we dissect the body of a human being or an animal, we find that it is formed of a number of organs such as the heart, the stomach, the brain, the hand each with some particular type of work to do for the benefit of the whole organism. Every organ in its turn is composed of a number of tissues, each of which seems to be homogeneous. The stomach, for instance, is formed of secreting tissue inside, muscular tissue outside, and it is supported and bound together by connective tissue, and is penetrated throughout by blood tissue in the blood vessels and nervous tissue in the nerves. But when we come to examine these tissues under a good microscope, we find that they are not homogeneous at all, but composed of a number of separate units called cells. In the blood these cells are separate and independent, while in other tissues they are united with each other. Many people still find it difficult to believe that man is descended from simian ancestors, these in their turn from lower mammals, 
and so from ever simpler and simpler progenitors. They can never have grasped the plain facts of observation, that the body of every man and woman alive has grown from a minute, undifferentiated cell. Every higher animal starts life as a single cell, the fertilized ovum in the case of man. This measures no more than one one hundred and twenty-fifth of an inch in diameter. The processes of development can all be thought of in terms of cells, their multiplication, their migration, and their changes of form. The first stages in development consist in the cutting up of the ovum into a number of similar or almost similar rounded cells. In the next stage, the rough ground plan of the future embryo is blocked out by the formation of the three layers of cells to be found in all higher animals. During the succeeding stage, a more detailed plan is substituted for the rough sketch, and the main organ systems are laid down. The outer of the three layers give rise to the future brain and spinal cord, the eye, ear, and nose, the outer skin. The innermost layers modifies itself into a sketch of the gut, with liver, sweetbread, thyroid, and other glands, while the intermediate layer produces the rudiments of the blood system, the kidneys, the muscle, and the skeleton. With the intermediate layer are also associated the reproductive cells, but they, as we have seen, stand somewhat apart from the ordinary tissues of the body. We have spoken of the laying down of a plan. That and no more is what development has up to this stage produced. The rudiments of the future organs are distinguishable. They are in their proper places, but they do not yet work, and they do not work because the cells of which they are composed are still all nearly alike and not yet specialized to perform different duties. It is only in the succeeding stage, the stage of tissue differentiation, that the various types of cells lose their original rounded or cubical forms and begin assuming the appearance which they will have in their developed organisms. Some of the chief types of cell change that occur may be briefly mentioned. The blood cells. The blood cells are of two sorts. One is active and resembles an amoeba in its capacity for changing its shape and swallowing foreign particles. These are the white corpuscles or phagocytes. On the other hand, the red corpuscles, from which blood derives its color, the liquid part or plasma being colorless, are mere discs charged with hemoglobin, the pigment which by its affinity for oxygen and carbonic acid gas is the vehicle of respiration. These red corpuscles are produced in the marrow of the long bones and are continually being butted off there, to be destroyed in the spleen when worn out. When a smooth lining to a cavity is required, as in the abdominal cavity round the intestine, the cells bordering it become flattened and pieced together like the bits of a jigsaw puzzle. When, on the other hand, cells are destined to manufacture and pour out chemical substances, in other words to become part of a gland, they are elongated vertically and drops of secretion can be seen within them. The tissues where reserve food is to be stored up in the form of fat are made up of cells stretched like a tight skin over the fat droplet which they contain. When hard supporting tissue is to be formed as in the skeleton, it too is produced by the activity of cells. In gristle or cartilage, for instance, the rounded cells form layer after layer of glassy gelatinous material round themselves whilst in the bone the cells are branched and arranged regularly, and the material they lay down round themselves is hardened with lime salts. In the same way, the connective tissue which binds all the organs of the body together is made chiefly of microscopic fibers, some tough and resistant, some elastic, but these are all formed by the cells lying scattered between them. The meat we eat is mainly muscle. A muscle, too, is made of cells. In smooth muscle, as in the bladder, the cells are very long with faint longitudinal lines. But in the more efficient striped muscle of our limbs, which is under the direct control of the will, the cells are enormous, with many nuclei, and the microscope shows that the substance of the cells is cross-striated. The alternation of dark and light bands which gives this appearance is, in some way as yet unknown, necessary for rapid contraction and it is best developed in such muscles as those of insects' wings, which vibrate with almost inconceivable rapidity. The cells of the outer skin, or epidermis, have a singular fate. They are continually being sacrificed for the good of the body as a whole. 
The lower layers of the epidermis consist of rounded cells which are rapidly multiplying. As the cells thus produced approach the surface, they become flattened and, finally, converted into horny material, which eventually flakes off as a so-called scarf skin. The continual shedding of this usually passes unheeded, but becomes at once evident by the masses of it which accumulate when a bandage is left on for long. By this means, the skin continually renews itself, and the soiled and bruised outer layers are shed, and replaced by new cells from below. A similar conversion of cells from horny material takes place in our nails and hair, but here the horny structures are relatively permanent. The brain cells. The brain, too, the organ of mind itself, is composed of cells. The cells of the brain and spinal cord undergo perhaps the most remarkable development of all. Originally in the embryo, they are of simple and rounded form, and like other cells, they develop outgrowths, usually two in number, which often grow to great lengths and may branch repeatedly. Of the finest terminal branches, some come into contact with the cells of muscles and glands, others with the cells of sense organs like the eye and ear, or the touch spots in the skin others with similar outgrowths of other nerve cells. In this way, every organ in the body is linked up with every other. Through the mediation of a living telephone system, formed by chains of nerve cells and their outgrowths, the usual motor nerve cell, that is a nerve cell connected in sending messages to muscle and glands, has a short outgrowth within the spinal cord, whose branches connect with the branches of several other nerve cells of different sorts but the characteristic feature is a very long nerve fiber leading to the muscle concerned. This in the case of the nerve supplying the muscle of the foot may be several feet in length. The most extraordinary cells in the body are probably those in the forebrain, or main part of the forebrain, in the layer which is the seat of the process of thought. The figure, facing page 684, will show the immense complexity of their interlacing branches a complexity which presumably makes possible the amazing process which we call the association of ideas. Finally, the act of reproduction itself is carried out by special cells which are formed in the reproductive organs and set free when mature. In early stages, both types of reproductive cells have the same rounded form in large nucleus. But, while the female cell or ovum remains rounded, and increases enormously in size by the accumulation within itself of yolk grains as reserve food material, the male cells remain small and finally become transformed into spermatozoa. The nucleus condenses and elongates to form the so-called head, and the rest of the cell is pulled out to form a long, actively vibrating tail, by means of which the sperm propels itself, and eventually, it may be, reaches the ovum. Section 4. The Body, a Huge Cell State Cells are, for the most part, quite microscopic in size. Human red blood corpuscles, for instance, are so tiny that, in the volume of blood equal to a cube one millimeter each way, about one fifteen thousandth of a cubic inch, some five millions of them are floating, roughly the population of London as the amount of blood in an average man amounts to about seven pounds by weight. This figure must be multiplied about three million times to give the total number of red corpuscles in the body. A similar figure would be found for other sorts of cells. The body is thus, in one sense, a huge cell state, with a cell population thousands of times larger than the total human population of the world. A single act of thought involves the cooperation of a vast multitude of brain cells. A single movement of a limb implies the contraction of thousands of muscle cells. A single beat of the heart sends billions of blood cells whirling down the dark pipes that we call blood vessels. Each of these cells is a unit of life, comparable in some respects to a single free living cell, such as an amoeba or a slipper animalcule. The enforcement of harmony and cooperation among such a vast multitude of units is the greatest achievement of evolving life. How necessary such enforcement is, and yet how difficult, is shown by the effects of cell insubordination, as in cancer and malignant growths. In cancer, a few cells embark upon a career of unchecked growth 
and multiplication at the expense of the rest, and by so doing involve themselves and the rest of the cell community in the common ruin of death. End of section 9. Of the Outline of Science, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Irma Martin. The Outline of Science by J. Arthur Thompson. Chapter 19 Biology, Part 2. Section 5 Reproduction. One of the fundamental attributes of living matter perhaps the most fundamental of all, is its capacity for assimilation, for building up into its own complex likeness the simpler chemical compounds by which it is surrounded. What is more, in all primitive forms of life, assimilation is more rapid than its converse. New living molecules are constructed and put into place in the organism faster than the old ones are used up. The result is growth. But to increase in size is to increase volume faster than surface, and this is, metaphorically speaking, to increase your population faster than you increase your import and export facilities. The difficulties inherent in large size are felt by life in all its forms. As a matter of fact, the evolution of higher from lower forms abounds in devices for overcoming these difficulties. The lowest forms of life, however, have never seriously faced the problem. As soon as the inconveniences of growth are felt, they are surmounted by the simple process of division into two halves, or, as it is technically called, of binary fission. Bacteria, unicellular animals and plants, and the cells of which the bodies of higher, multicellular organisms are built, multiply almost without exception by this method. It will be seen that sex does not enter into this simplest and most obvious method of reproduction. Furthermore, no substance is lost in the process. The one whole simply divides into halves, which then are reorganized into two new wholes. Fission continues as a common method of reproduction among the simpler types of multicellular animals. Many worms, for instance, adopt it. In some cases, the products of division may remain attached, forming a chain for some time. But as evolution proceeds, fission becomes more and more difficult. In an insect, for instance, or a cuttlefish, the processes of reorganization after division would be impossibly complicated, and, while division and reorganization were going on, the animal's powers of movement would be interfered with, and it would fall an easy victim to its enemies. When an organism becomes more complicated, therefore, other methods have to be devised. The commonest method, which prevails in corals and many other selenerates, in some worms, and in the degenerate relatives of the vertebrates, known as ascidians, is that of budding. Budding is, in essence, unequal fission. The organism as a whole remains unaltered except that one small portion of it is divided off and becomes reorganized into a new miniature whole. Usually, the bud remains attached to the parent during its period of growth and organization, and in animals with more complicated types of budding, whole chains of buds are formed, and new individuals are thus produced in rapid succession. Many disadvantages of fission are obviated by budding, but it would scarcely work with animals which possess a complicated skeleton. And besides, the ordinary body tissues of the highest animals have lost the power of unlimited growth, needful if buds are to be formed. However, as soon as multicellular animals and plants had been evolved, the sexual process inevitably became associated with reproduction. The sexual process implies the union of two single cells into one, and thus to effect it two cells must be detached from the multicellular animals to which they belong, and the cell produced by their union must multiply and grow into a new many-celled individual. 
A sexual process, however, does occur in many unicellular animals. In such as the slipper animalcule, for instance, the asexual reproduction by fission will take place once or twice a day and may continue for a great number of generations through weeks or months or even years. At intervals, however, this cycle or unlimited multiplication is broken by what is called conjugation. Individuals come together mouth to mouth in pairs. Their fluid internal substance comes in contact with their mouths. A complicated division of their nuclei which, as we have seen in a previous chapter, are the bearers of hereditary qualities, occurs. And finally, one nucleus from either member of the pair travels across and unites with a stationary nucleus in the other member. Thereafter, the two separate and embark upon a new sexual cycle of fission. A similar process occurs in most, perhaps in all, unicellular animals and plants. Only in the bacteria, which can hardly be styled cells, does it seem to be universally absent. Often the process is less complicated than in the slipper animalcule. Two individuals simply come together and unite, first their bodies and then their nuclei, so that one individual is formed from two. But in every case conjugation involves the fusing of nuclei from two individuals. Conjugation is the simplest form in which we find the sexual process. Two facts merit remark. First, we see that sexual fusion needs not involve difference of sex. The two gametes, as the cells are called which unite during the process, may be alike. Secondly, we see that sex is primitively not associated with reproduction. In multicellular animals, however, the gametes are always of two different sorts. The male gametes or spermatozoa and the female gametes or ova. The former are almost always very small intensely active and consist almost entirely of a head which contains the condensed nucleus and a tail by whose movements they swim. The latter are large, often very large cells and have sacrificed their motility in favor of the storing up of reserve material for the use of the embryo which is to grow out of them. When multicellular animals have reached a considerable size and length of life they can produce the microscopic gametes in enormous quantities and for long periods. A female sea urchin produces annually about as many eggs as there are human beings in London. And the number of sperms produced by any of the higher animals during its lifetime is considerably greater, not only than the whole present population of the world, but than the total number of human beings that can have existed since man first appeared upon the earth. In such animals, therefore, the only form of reproduction is sexual. In small and shorter-lived multicellular animals, however, sexual reproduction is still attended by certain drawbacks. Only a few eggs can be produced at a time by a small female, and if the necessity for fathers could be done away with, twice as many individuals could be engaged in producing offspring. When, therefore, animals are too complex for fission or budding, and too small for the full advantages of sexual reproduction to be felt, still another form of propagation known as parthenogenesis is often to be found. Mothers but no fathers Parthenogenesis consists in this, that an egg develops without uniting with the sperm. In order to make sure of the fusion of nuclei, which is the essential of sexual reproduction, eggs are usually rendered incapable of developing without some stimulus afforded by the sperm's entry. Parthenogenetic eggs need no stimulus and start to develop as soon as mature, so that once more, but in another form, we find reproduction as a special case of unlimited growth. Parthenogenesis is found in such creatures as plant lice, aphids, and a good many other insects, water fleas, and wheel animalcules, which all reproduce by its means throughout the summer and only produce males in the autumn. And as we shall see later, it can be artificially provoked in many other forms of life. A drone bee, too, develops from an unfertilized egg. It has a mother, but no father whereas the queens and workers arise from fertilized eggs. To sum up, we may say that reproduction is always the result of growth. 
and always must be the separation of one part of an organism from the rest. As life evolves, the part separated, at first equal to the rest of the organism, becomes proportionately smaller and smaller, and the sexual process, at first antagonistic to reproduction, becomes associated with it, at first in part and finally altogether. Section 6. Regeneration The power of unlimited growth is at the bottom not only of ordinary reproduction, but of regeneration as well. We are apt to look upon regeneration as something marvelous, because it does not occur to any appreciable extent in ourselves, or in any of the higher animals with which we are familiar. But, as a matter of fact, it is a necessary and inevitable property of the lowest forms of life. The simplest way, perhaps, of realizing the inevitability of regeneration is to remember that the appearance and structure of any animal or plant is the product of the balance between its own constitution and the environment that surrounds it. This is true, of course, for many portions of matter that are not alive. A drop of mercury on a saucer, for instance, assumes approximately the shape of a sphere, because of the laws of surface tension between mercury and air, and mercury and china. If we cut it in two, each half becomes a separate sphere. If a drop of mercury were an organism, we should say that its typical form was spherical, and that any fragment of the whole was capable of reorganizing itself in the typical form. If we take a single cell animal and cut it into two or into many parts, each part providing it is above a certain minimum size and contains the whole or part of the nucleus, will readjust itself until it is once more in a state of equilibrium, in other words, until it is of the normal shape and structure of the species. Furthermore, the miniature animals thus produced, unlike the miniature drop of mercury, are capable of growth, so that in these simple forms regeneration is the necessary outcome of the two faculties of reorganization and growth. Even in many multicellular animals, a similar unlimited power of regeneration is to be found. Any piece of the stem of a polyp, any fragment of a planarian flatworm, will in almost all cases reorganize itself into a new whole. Producing a new head In these larger organisms, the mechanism of the process is somewhat complicated. It appears that if a piece of flatworm, for instance, be separated from the rest, it will first produce a new head region, and that the head region once formed will control the rest of the piece so that all the rest of the parts of the body are formed in order from head to tail. One may say that each part of the body is in some way dominant to all the parts that are posterior to it. If a cut is made on the side of the body, the tissues at the cut are often so stimulated by the shock of the operation that they escape from their bondage to the dominant head and produce a new head on their own account. In other cases the cut may be so made that new growth will occur at the cut surface, but the new tissue will still be under the influence of the old, and so a new but supernumerary tail will be produced. In this way extraordinary forms may be artificially produced, with extra head and tails, or consisting of little else than two opposite facing heads, like the Roman Janus. It has even been possible to alter the whole polarity of an animal. A piece of the stem of a polyp, for example, will in ordinary circumstances produce a head only, or first at its anterior end. But if it is exposed to dilute poisons or narcotics, the whole piece will lose its differentiation and revert to a shapeless lump. When this is replaced in pure water, it will regenerate but the head will not form at either of the original ends, but from the upper surface, where there is the most abundant supply of oxygen. But perhaps the most remarkable power of regeneration is exhibited by many sponges and polyps, which can be dissociated into their component units without losing the power of regrowth. If a sponge be chopped into small bits, and the pieces then strained through the finest bolting silk, nothing will come through the meshes, save the cells of which the sponge is composed, 
either singly or in groups of ten or a dozen. The bottom of the dish into which they are strained will be covered with the film of these microscopic units. These will join up to form a number of little spheres, about the size of a sponge embryo. In each of these the cells will rearrange themselves in proper order, and the sphere, reorganizing itself into a miniature sponge, will thus perform a veritable miracle of vitality. Section 7. Remarkable Experiments Other such apparent miracles, depending upon the reorganizing power of living things, are seen as the result of grafting experiments. It is comparatively easy to graft pieces of earthworms together, and by this means worms have been produced longer than normal, shorter than normal, with the central piece reversed so that its front end points to the rear, and all apparently healthy. But this pales before the remarkable experiment of Harrison, who grafted the front half of a newly hatched tadpole of one species, onto the posterior half of the tadpole of another species. The compound creature throve, grew, and metamorphosed into a normal frog. The only unusual point about it was the fact that, since the two species of frog differed in color, one half of the animal was light-colored, the other dark. In plants even more intimate unions have been made. Winkler grafted a piece of one species of solanum, the genus to which the potato belongs, onto a stalk of another species, waited until the union had been well established, and then cut the stem across, just at the point of junction. The bud which grew out was formed of the intermingled tissues of the two species, the outer layers being formed from one, the inner from the other. It was a real example of being in someone else's skin. The compound plant or graft hybrid was healthy, the only sign of abnormality being that, since the rates of growth of the two components were not quite the same, the skin did not fit accurately over the core, and the leaves had a crinkled look. As we ascend the scale of animal life, the power of regeneration dwindles. A crab or a newt will die if it is cut in two, but it retains the power of restoring lost limbs. It is at first sight very remarkable that the animal can restore just what was lost, no less and no more, but this becomes more intelligible if we think in terms of the idea of equilibrium. The balance is upset by the operation, and it is not restored until the missing part has been replaced. If we alter the inner machinery of the animal, or if we alter the outer environment, the balance may not be the same as before, and we shall get abnormal results. For instance, below certain temperatures, a half-flat worm will not grow a new head at all, while at high temperature it will grow one which is larger than the normal. Here we have altered the outer world. The most remarkable example of an altered result due to an alteration in the animal is to be found in various prawns and shrimps. These have their eyes mounted on stalks, and the part of the brain connected with sight is to be found near the top of the stalk. If the eye alone is cut off, a perfect new one is regenerated, but if the eye is cut off together with the part of the brain in the stalk, what is regenerated is not an eye but an organ identical with the first of the animal's two feelers or antennae. This happens only when the regenerating nerve makes a connection with the rest of the brain, so that here it is clear that the different parts of the brain have an influence in determining what the regenerated part shall be like. A somewhat similar example, showing the influence which one part may have over another, is seen in the formation of the lens of the eye in young newts and salamanders. The eye has a compound origin in development. The sensitive part, or retina, is derived from a cup-like outgrowth arising from the brain, the optic cup. The lens is formed as a thickening in the skin just over the cup. Various experiments have proved that the formation of the lens at the exact place in which it will be useful is due to some chemical influence. Of the same nature, no doubt, as that exerted by the ductless glands, exerted upon the skin by the developing optic cup. If the skin is removed from the side of the head over the cup, and a piece from some other part of the body, or even from some other animal, is grafted on in its place, the new grafted piece will produce a lens.
But if the optic cup is taken out and grafted under the skin elsewhere, for example, near the tail, no lens will be formed in the head, but one will be produced over the optic cup in the tail region. It is largely by such influence of one part upon another that the progressive increase of complexity in development comes about. Section 8. Losing a Tail to Save a Life In the highest group of animals regeneration of large parts cease altogether. Birds and mammals can rarely replace anything but small losses. Sometimes the primitive power of regeneration is kept on for special reasons. Lizards, for instance, cannot regenerate their limbs, but they are specially liable to be caught by their tail as they disappear into their hiding places. Accordingly, we find that the vertebrae of the tail are of special construction, so that they can be broken in two by a voluntary muscular contraction, and the whole tail thrown off. And furthermore, the tail, and the tail alone of all the organs of the body, can be regenerated. The animal loses its tail, but saves its life. This restriction of the power to regenerate is to be found in individual development, as well as in racial evolution. The frog, for instance, cannot regenerate lost limbs. The tadpole can. Tadpoles, on the other hand, will not survive and reorganize after being cut in two, but the very earliest stages of development will survive this process. By tying a thread round the developing egg of a newt, so as to constrict it into two separate parts, the egg may be made to give rise to two perfectly normal newts instead of the single one that it would normally form. This has a bearing upon human problems. As everyone knows, there exists two kind of twins, those which are not more alike than ordinary brothers and sisters, and may be of either sex, and those, the so-called identical twins, whose resemblance is so striking as to lead to confusion and whose sex is always the same. This latter kind of twin is produced when the embryo in its very earliest stages of growth is, by some accident or other, separated into two independent halves. A pair of identical twins represent a single human being, which chance has decreed shall become two. Our previous remarks about the restriction of asexual reproduction in higher forms thus require a little qualification, for even in the highest groups it may still occur in early stages. The different members of a litter of mammals generally arise from separate fertilized eggs. But in the Texas armadillo, the quadruplets which the female always produces are formed by buddings from a single embryo. Here, therefore, identical twins are normal, while in human beings they are accidental, but in both cases they are the result of the power of unlimited reorganization and growth to be found in the early stages of all animals. A consideration of these facts leads us on to other fields. For one thing, there is cancer. In cancer it appears that certain cells of the body escape from the dominating or controlling activity of the rest, and start unregulated growth on their own account. What is more, they seem in some particulars to revert to a more primitive condition, in which their powers of growth and multiplication are increased, and their capacity for performing the ordinary work demanded from the various cells, which cooperate in a healthy body, is correspondingly impaired. What a delicate balance exists in the body of one of the higher animals is shown by the observation of Miss Sly on spontaneous cancer in mice. Some of the female mice which developed the disease were kept separate, while others were mated and allowed to breed. In the former lot the cancer grew at a great rate, and death occurred in about a month. But in the second lot, so long as litter followed litter without pause, the tumor's growth was negligible, to become active, however, as soon as reproduction ceased. In other words, the tumor and the developing embryos were competing for food substances for their growth, and the embryos were so successful in their demands that they left next to nothing over the cancer. In any event, even though we are very far from any proper understanding of the cancer problem, the general idea drawn from the fields of regeneration, of dominance and subordination of parts, of the decrease of growth power during development, and of the struggle between the parts of an animal, provide us with the point of view which made the beginning of future progress.
Section 9, Old Age and Death When fission occurs, as in unicellular animals, there is, in a certain sense, no death. There is at least no corpse. Individuals appear and disappear, but barring accidents the same substance flows on through time in a stream of growth and fission. In multicellular animals, however, the germ cells alone constitute this stream. The body persists for a time, but eventually, even if it escapes all accidents, dies an inevitable natural death. In general, as we mount higher in the evolutionary scale, we find that the individual body has a longer span of life allotted to it, and further, this increased length of life is due much less to an increased period of growth than to a prolongation of the adult period. In lower animals, growth is usually continuous, only terminated by death, but in all the higher, it comes to an end comparatively soon, and the prime of life is a period when change is reduced to a minimum, and the animal can continue applying what it has learned to the business of life untroubled by deep-seated physiological alterations within itself. In many lower animals, the changes that lead to aging are definitely reversible, and age can be kept at bay under certain experimental conditions. In unicellular organisms, for instance, increase of size seems to be the cause which brings about fission and the disappearance of the individual. By cutting off a small part of the animal each time that it approaches full size, it is possible to keep it from dividing, apparently for an indefinite time. Or again, planarian worms, in addition to their extraordinary powers of regeneration, are able to survive very long periods of starvation by the simple procedure of living on themselves, gradually decreasing in size the while. As they get smaller, they also become more active. This activity seems to be a real sign of rejuvenescence, of renewed youth, for if they are alternately fed and starved so as to keep them within certain limits of size, they do not age, and persist as Professor Child has shown, for as long as the experimenter has patience to continue his experiment. Resting Stages other animals have the extraordinary property of living backwards in another way, of reverting to a more simple condition by a process which, since it is the opposite of differentiation, is styled de-differentiation. The Ascidian clavellina, for instance, although a sedentary animal, is of considerable complexity, with gill slits and heart, stomach and intestine, nervous and reproductive systems. When it is placed in unfavorable conditions, which yet are not sufficient to kill it, it shrinks, becomes more and more opaque, all the different kinds of cells of which it is made become more and more alike, until it at last comes to consist of a mere white lump, shapeless and containing nothing but a few rounded bags, and a mass of loose cells to represent all its original complexity. When placed in clean water again, it develops anew, and becomes once more a normal individual of somewhat smaller size than before. These processes of de-differentiation are of great importance in many unicellular animals and in bacteria. They lead to the formation of resting stages in which the organisms can tide over hard times. Further, since de-differentiation can be followed, apparently over and over again by fresh differentiation, the simple individual can be made to live an indefinite period by such means. These methods are not effective with higher animals, but even in insects and probably in all other cold-blooded creatures, life may be greatly prolonged by low temperature. Professor Loeb, for instance, found that while the life of the little American fruit fly was 54 days at ordinary temperatures, it was only 21 days at 30 degrees centigrade but could be prolonged to 177 days by keeping the animals at 10 degrees centigrade. But in warm-blooded animals with an adult period in which no growth takes place, such as birds and mammals, the span of life cannot be lengthened in any of these ways. The adult period is one of very carefully adjusted balance, and when the balance is upset, old age sets in, to be followed by inevitable death. Interesting Experiments in this connection, one very interesting fact has been discovered in recent years, namely that many of the tissues of which the body is composed 
are potentially immortal, although the body itself is doomed to death. By careful methods, it has been found possible to cultivate in nutritive fluids outside the body small pieces taken from a living animal, transplanting them to new portions of fluid every few days. Carol in New York has cultivated a piece of connective tissue taken from a chick before hatching for longer than the full normal lifetime of a hen. And what is most remarkable, the rate of growth and multiplication of the cells composing it did not decrease. We must suppose that the balance and interaction of the different tissues, each checking and counter-checking the other, lead to death, whereas the unchecked multiplication of any one sort of cell, if the right conditions of food and expansion are provided, can continue indefinitely. If we wish to prolong the existence of the whole, which is our only practical concern, we must attempt to discover what are the organs involved in maintaining the balance of adult life and then try to help them as they begin to fail. Section 10. The Ductless Glands Our knowledge is still very scanty, but it seems quite clear that the chief organs concerned are on the one hand the so-called ductless glands and on the other the nervous system, the brain especially. The ductless glands are organs which pour their secretions directly into the blood and many of these secretions, or hormones as they are often called, have an extraordinary power over the growth of the body, its rate of working, and the cooperation of its parts. The pituitary gland in the brain, for instance, has a great influence upon growth, especially upon the skeleton. Giants usually seem to be produced by an excessive development of this gland. The thyroid may be considered as the drought of life's fire, if it is deficient, the fire burns low, and there results a disease known as myxedema, in which bodily and mental processes are all sluggish. Too much thyroid, on the other hand, leads to wasting away, in spite of increased appetite, to increased pulse rate, and to nervousness. Part of the reproductive organs, the so-called interstitial tissue, also acts thus as a gland, and produces a secretion which influences the growth of all the bodily characters associated with one sex or the other, and stimulates the brain, bringing into the activity the sexual instincts. Steinach in Vienna has found that rats which had begun to show signs of senile decay could be rejuvenated by means of operations which stimulated the interstitial gland, or by grafting into them reproductive organs from young animals. As a result, all the other ductless glands in the body were stimulated to renewed life, and the failing brain and all its mental faculties were revivified. By this means he was able to prolong the life of rats by about 40%. These results so far stand alone. They need confirmation on other animals, and long testing to see whether they are applicable to man, but at least they open a window onto new fields of work and show what revolutionary results may be expected when biological research finds men, money, and time. For it is a laborious, expensive, and delicate business to investigate in fullness of detail the complicated machinery of the mammalian body. Such work, however, promises at best an increase of the span of life. Death is bound to come at last. In this connection, the work of the great Russian scientist, Mechnikov, should be remembered. He investigated all the cases which he could find, and they are relatively uncommon, of men and women who died a really natural death, of pure old age uncomplicated by disease or accident, and, as a result, he asserted that such a death is really natural, that it is not painful, and what is more, that it is not dreaded, but looked forward to as one sleeps after a long day. Finally, he asserted, what would be difficult to deny, that nine-tenths of the accidents and diseases that beset mankind could be prevented. And if they were, the natural death, instead of being the accidental fortune of a few, would be the birthright of our average humanity. In matters biological, we are only just emerging from the age of mythology, through a period of observation, into one of experiment. And this in its turn is opening up vistas of future control, hitherto undreamt of, over the processes of life itself. In the little domain with which we have been dealing, we can see clearly held out to us, as the reward of patient labor, 
the possibility of prolonging the normal life of man, and of robbing death, which so often shadows human thought, of the worst of its terrors. The problem of heredity and mendelism was discussed in the chapter How Darwinism Stands Today. End of section 10